it's been quite a while since I last did anything like this. Um, in fact, I was, I was thinking about this, and uh, when, we, when we met at a show in uh, Cambridge at the Commuter Museum, it's 20 years since I left Acorn, okay? So I think enough time has passed that it's now kind of historical rather than relatively live, if you see what I mean. So, um, so I'm just gonna, what I want to do tonight is, if I can, is just give you a little bit of a personal perspective on the last years of Acorn, because that's the time I was there. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with a little bit of background. You may or may not know, I don't, how many people know, remember me from those days? That's, that's very scary. I've got to say, that's incredibly scary. Um, so uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a personal background, and I'll talk a bit from my perspective what happened all the way through those, those times. And, you know, it'll be, it, I, may, I may be telling you stuff you already know. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. So I, um, I graduated from Cambridge University in 81, uh, which is kind of why I ended up in Cambridge. I did a couple of years on the oil rigs. Uh, working for a company called Schlumberger, uh, it, actually in the North Sea, which was kind of interesting and different. Uh, obvious, I had a degree in physics, so it's obvious I would work in the oil rigs. And then I went and worked for a company that made uh, test and measurement equipment, particularly digital storage oscilloscopes. And uh, so I work, worked for them for about 10 years. And I, I started just, you know, kind of doing some technical stuff and I ended up doing, I ran, I r ended up running their marketing department. I did a stint in the States. I actually ran an engineering team for about 18 months as well, which is kind of an interesting, you know, kind of just because that's what was needed at the time. And that company was based in Hainault in London, and I lived in Cambridge, so I used to drive up and down the M11 every day, which is, was fine early on and got progressively worse as the traffic built up. And then we had a family and we had small children, and this wasn't great. And somebody we knew saw a job advert for a company called Acorn uh, that had an office in Histon, and I live in Histon, yeah. right? So I thought, oh, this is great. So I applied, and I got rejected. Um, but they said, we, we're not for that job, but we might have another job that you might be interested in. So um, they, sent me the, they sent me the spec, and I've got various bits of paper, and I'm going to pass them around. So this, this was the job spec I was given for this job. If anybody, if you have a look, have a look, just pass them, if you can pass, you know, have a, have a great, I'm gonna do this with live, this is what this stack's for. I'm just gonna hand some bits around uh, as we go along. Um, and so I, I went and I got interviewed by a guy called Peter Bonder, who I'm sure a lot of you will remember. Um, and it was probably the worst interview I've ever done in my entire life, right? It was dreadful. Um, I didn't use RiscOS at that point. I had no idea about it. I was being interviewed for the enthusiast marketing role, <laughs> which for somebody that didn't know anything about the product seemed a bit weird to me. But anyway, you know, what, who was I? I'd applied to do something in education. I got interviewed for this one for, um, and you know, I got asked, you know, if you don't know anything about RiscOS, isn't that a bit of a disadvantage? So I flannelled massively. I'm a marketing guy. What do you expect? Um, anyway, we, we went on holiday after that. And I got back off holiday to the, all these increasingly frantic messages about, is it okay, we want to offer you the job. <laughs> I was I, I, in my head, I was convinced this wasn't going to happen. Anyway, so I joined Acorn. I joined Acorn on the 2nd of January 1995 was when I actually started. Um, and I was working in, um, on the Vision Park in Histon. I don't know, if, has anybody ever seen the building on the Vision Park in Histon? It's a beautiful place to work. It was five minutes walk from my home. It was a lovely office. Um, that is the, the desk layout and floor plan from when I started, with all the names of who sat where, if anybody's interested. <laughs> so for those of you that recognize any of these names, they're, they're, so just do, do take it, have a look, you know, pass it around. Um, these, these things I've got, uh, you know, some bits will be obvious, some bits like this are actually probably more interesting. Um, so there's three pages of that from the different floors of the building. So, uh, and it was a beautiful glass fronted building, looked down onto a lake, there was a sandwich shop just opposite the lake, you used to go out and sit, eat, sit, sit in the sun, eat your sandwich, it was a fantastic place to work. Um, and so I was looking after the enthusiast market sector, that's what I've been brought in to do. Um, and Peter and uh, a guy called Saul Dobney had come up with this uh, plan to, to work on the, um, the enthusiast market to try and drive some, uh, some excitement to get some advocacy going in that marketplace. And that's what they wanted. And that's where the idea of the clan came from. 
I walked in to implement that. That wasn't my name. That wasn't my idea. I hated the name The Clan. I have to say, ever since I started, I thought it was the worst name we ever invented for that. But anyway, that was what it was. I mean, I wasn't going to change it. I was just, my job was to make it fly. Um, so, yeah, so I did that. Um, my training was quite interesting in Risk OS. Um, so I got a little bit of straightforward training from the, the training team. But the main training I got was there was a room full of junk. And Peter said, what I want you to do is build the biggest risk PC you can with lots of different layers of SCSI hard drive, slide scan, all kinds of random bits that might or might not be working. <laughs> and we've just thrown them in this room. And I want you to try and get that working and do various exciting, do something interesting with it. So I spent weeks fighting with bits of hardware that didn't work and trying to figure out how everything went together and everything else. Um, but yeah, um, so as well as doing that, what I did was I went around talking to the various different people. Um, and what became obvious to me is that Acorn as a company was quite exciting, but the community around it was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I mean, what people were developing, what the different people were working on was just amazing what, the, what these guys were doing. Um, and one of the earliest people I actually met was Alex Van Someren. I don't know if anybody remembers him. But, but at, and, and the idea of writing a browser. So at that time, you had Netscape being written, mm -hmm. and Nico was writing a browser mm -hmm. that was a bright equivalent, not far off equivalent to Netscape, for our platform. And so these sorts of things were going on at the time. So there was all sorts of stuff happening around that time. Um, now, I, I thought this enthusiast base was really interesting and exciting. Most of the rest of the company didn't rate it, OK? <laughs> So um, my unofficial job title that persisted all the way through my time at Acorn was Captain Anorak. <laughs> right? That's what everybody called me. <laughs> uh, because I was looking after these guys that were just in, excited about the product that we had and excited about the technology and excited about what we could do. I never, said, I never called it that. I never did. I, I, was, I was always much more uh, interested in what was happening. So um, did our first Acorn World show as well. That was, that was quite an exciting event. I mean, having your own community, your own uh, group, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. But then, um, so that was my world. I was, I was really happy. We were having a great time doing lots of exciting things, getting some marketing materials going, getting clan t-shirts. Here we go, clan t-shirts going, all this kind of stuff. Lots of, you know, trying to get some in information going, trying to work with the press. We had journalists that were, were talking to us and publishing articles. Uh, and all sorts of things going on. Um, but the rest of the business around was not doing quite so well. Um, in those days, the company was run by Sam Walcott. Um, and, you know, it hadn't been performing very well. And eventually, he left. And there was a big, big reorganization um, <laughs> in, according to my notes, on the 12th of September, uh, 1995. So I've been there nine months. And suddenly, there's layoffs, there's cutbacks, there's a complete reorganization. And at that time, uh, David Lee had taken over. And that was the organization chart that, persist that came up. So, <laughs> so I've, I've been going through all my notes here. <laughs> okay. Going through all my notes, uh, looking at those. Um, basically, that's when Ac Acorn Risk Technologies got spun out into a separate division under Pete Bonder, sitting alongside online media and the education business uh, run by a guy called Michael Reardon. So that was kind of like the legacy business, and that was, that was still sitting. I was part of the education business because I was part of the computer bit. So I was selling computers. That's what the education team did, and software and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I was, I was carried on working there. And that was a, you know, not a great situation. Lots of people had been laid off. They'd had lots of cutbacks. Um, and then I, I can't honestly remember the date this happened now. but. Uh, a Acorn Risk Technologies moved out of the Vision Park in Histon and onto Newmarket Road, which is where online media were based. So that online media had, had had their own separate space, and Acorn Risk Technologies moved into that. And at some point late on in '95, Pete, Pete Bonder asked me if I'd come over. And I remember, it's, I, it's a very vivid memory for me, there was an office, there was no furniture because they just moved in. Um, and we sat on boxes of photocopier paper because that's all there was, <laughs> hanging about. Um, and he said, right, I've, I've got a, an opportunity for you. 
I'd like you to come and work for me here um, and sell as much as you can to make as much profit as you can to fund the technology development and if we're successful there might be a job for you at the end of it. <laughs> right, that's, that was, that, literally those words, that was, that was the offer and I was like, yeah, brilliant, I'm up for that because I really didn't want to be sat in this education lot. I mean, it was just like, it was just death. It was awful, you know. Um, so, so I moved in to become part of ART, Echo Risk Technologies. I don't have a handy mouse mat there. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really quite an interesting time. So we'd gone from this big corporate entity, lots of, lots of stuff going on, lots of processes, Acorn Risk Technologies was in this scruffy little office space on the ground floor and we were surrounded by shipping crates. You know, the, you know the green crates with the folding lids? There were stacks of them, like stacks of them everywhere around us. Nobody had time to unpack them, we were busy. <laughs> right? So we'd moved all this stuff out of Vision Park, out of the huge offices, we just stacked it there and just got on with things. Um, there was me running the computer business. That was it. I was it in terms of the sales marketing. Every so we'd gone from this big corporate thing to just myself doing that. And that was, um, yeah, it was fun, actually. From my point of view, it was fantastic. Because I, I vividly remember talking to like dealers in Germany, and they're going, oh, but you have to do this, and we have to have this. I was like, no, you don't. You want to buy some stuff, I'll sell it to you. That's fine. Just let's just do, make a deal here. All the, all the bureaucracy, all the paperwork, all the, you know, we, just, we just sold stuff. That's all I did. We just, we just took away all of that and just got on with, we had uh, quite a lot of stock sitting in warehouses. You know, I'll return to that theme as I come through. But we had quite a lot of stock. I and mean, so we were basically just trying to sell everything. Now, at that time, Acorn Risk Technologies was doing probably the biggest deal of its life. So, oh, sorry, that was the clan stuff. Sorry, I, when we launched the clan, I got my clan membership card. <laughs> I found, I, no, no, I'm number... 1,360. I don't ask me why. <laughs> that was mine. I don't know if anybody ever had one of those. Those are some of the magazines that we did. I'll come back to those later. But um, so Acorn uh, Network Computers. So basically at that time, um, there was a very, very big deal going on. So this is when Oracle approached Acorn and said, we like this idea of this Citrix stuff. We like the idea of a really thin client on the desktop. And we think we can make a, a phenomenal business out of that. And Acorn sold them uh, a deal whereby we would create their product for them. They would have exclusivity. And they paid for the development of it. They paid some upfront royalties. And every unit they sold, they would pay royalties for because it was using our technology. And we were in a position where we could do this better than anybody else because we had the Citrix client running on our thing, which meant you could run Windows on a RiskOS platform, which is what everybody wanted to do in some form or another. Um, so the, I mean, the, to give you some idea of the numbers, the upfront pre-royalties were a million pounds of pre-royalties. Now, it was a very big deal, and Larry Ellison himself came to negotiate the closing of it to Newmarket Road in Cambridge. And this is the guy that runs the whole of Oracle and you know, still does. So he was actually there. He came, he negotiated it, we signed the deal. Um, it was signed by uh, David Rue from Oracle and Marco De Benedetti for Acorn. Because uh, there was quite a lot of involvement from Olivetti in Acorn at that point because they'd done all sorts of different deals. Um, so yeah, so the, the initial models of the network computer, um, uh, 7500 base, 4 meg of DRAM. Uh, they had a 14K4 modem option which would be upgraded later to 28K8. Just to give you some idea where we are in the evolution of internet and things, this was really quite advanced, really quite exotic and quite, quite unusual. Um, and yeah, so, so Art had this, this whole thing. So this is, I found, this is my only copy of this, but this is my, um, this was a sort of pack of Acorn Risk Technologies bump. So feel free to have a look through that. If I can pop that back in, that would be great. <laughs> Oh, don't worry about it, that's just my name. Um, so that's all, that's, yeah, there's a whole load of data sheets for network computers, technology. 
it wasn't just network computers that they were doing. They were trying to sell the technology into a whole host of different, different places and different venues. Um, so what you had, oh, okay, and then later that, earlier on in April 96, the education business got folded in with Apple into this thing called Exemplar, which was never a massive success. They moved out, they moved in. So basically, it was Acorn trying to get rid of a problem and trying to get some momentum with it with, a with Apple and fight against Windows. So Acorn Risk Technologies was busy trying to license the technology to anybody that wanted anything to do with internet, anything to do with small scale products. And it's really interesting when you look now at this, it's a Raspberry Pi sitting here, how close this is to what they were doing, actually, uh, 20 years ago, 23 years ago now. They, taking those technologies, folding them down, making them start up small, making them low power, making them easy. Um, so so some, of the, some of the people they work with, they work with a company called Netfax. Anybody ever come across? Probably never heard of that. So that was, a, I, think, I, think it was, it was America, I think it was an American company. Um, and they had this vision for replacing fax machines with internet email. Right? So rather... Well, the, the reason I'm smiling at this, the reason it sticks in my mind is because I just read a week ago an article about the NHS <laughs> trying to get rid of their fax machines and replacing <laughs> them with email. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> we were creating a little box that had a little happy smiley face when it, you know, all kinds of stuff to help people send their faxes over the internet rather than on fax lines. Um, never catch on. <laughs> it never did, actually. It never did. They, they paid for quite a lot of development and never managed to sell any, um, which is a bit of a shame because that was one of the things. But there were, there were lots of other things going, going on there. So during that time, um, DEC announced the, the strong arm. And, and that was, that was uh, for what we were doing. So we, we invented, we came up with this, uh, this, you know, for the RISC PC, the strong arm card, which I'm sure you've all seen, but this was one of the early prototypes. Pete Fox, one of the engineers, got these made into paperweights of one of the early prototypes. <laughs> there are a few of those around. Um, I've got one. Um, but I, I just I thought it was a lovely way of doing it. Um, but basically what we had was, I was trying to do the computer, the workstation, the, the desktop computing bit. And you had all these engineers all working on customer-funded projects, like for Oracle or for Netfax or for a whole range of other people whose names now escape me. Um, and I was having to beg, borrow, and steal engineer time to get this stuff written. Now, I was lucky because most of the engineers working for Acorn liked Acorn computers. Unsurprisingly, they worked there. And they wanted it to succeed. So they'd kind of find ways of doing what we needed to get done in amongst all these other, these other projects and, um, and getting that done. That was actually a really simple development. That was about as easy a product as, uh, as, you, as I can imagine um, to actually manufacture. It was small, it was discreet, it, it was an upgrade. We, we obviously spent quite a lot of time marketing it, coming up with all sorts of whizzy, whizzy ideas like you know, what number in the order of shipments were you gonna be and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, so we so we did quite a, we did quite a lot of that, um, and um, and obviously it was the the promotion for Acorn World that year, which we we were now running, not the not the old education team and everything else. It was us running it, and that was when we did. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but we did that promotion with the key and the locked risk PC, and we I, I, to my shame I haven't got a copy of it. We had the front cover of Byte magazine. You've got that copy with the key stuck on the front. Um, so I, that was, to me, from a marketing perspective, that was quite a coup because that was like taking us out of our ghetto, getting out into the thing, saying we've got something really exciting here and you could win it. And, you know, here's a physical key and it was a bit different and nobody had ever done that before and, and all that sort of stuff. There's a, quite an interesting story about this. So we had all this, this stuff set up and we had, there was a giant padlock about, you know, yay big. And I was looking after it. So we went and set up the show and everything else like that, and I had it with me. And so we went to the bar for a few drinks, and I, had, and I went to bed that night. About 3 a.m., I woke up, went, where's the padlock? <laughs> 
no, it's not in my room. I go wandering around the hotel trying to find anybody that's awake. Obviously, there wasn't anybody. It was in the middle of the night. Trying to figure out what had happened to this padlock. And I'd been drinking whiskies with David Lee, which was never a good plan. Um, <laughs> um, fortunately, somebody else had picked it up. And we had, but, but it would have been a bit of a disaster if having spent all that money and all that promotion, we'd actually lost the wretched thing. It came like within that close of doing that. That was that was pretty uh, that was pretty serious. So yeah. Did anyone win it? Like, was there only one? Nobody ever won it. No, there were about five or six keys that would have worked. There were there were quite a few keys that would have worked, uh, but nobody ever won it. I mean, it was genuine. I had no idea where they were. I mean, we just we shipped them all out. All the clan got one. It was on the front cover of Byte. Nobody nobody actually turned up with a working key. But there were lots of people tried it. Lots of people tried it. It was just you know. It was a bit of fun. It got, it got you know, got some, got some excitement. That's what we were trying for, was some excitement going for the strong arm and the strong arm wrist PC. Okay, so, so we're up to 96 uh, here. So the strong arm was a fantastic product. It made us a lot of money, okay? And that was my mission, remember? My mission was to make lots of money to fund the, the technology business while it got going and got its customers and got its, got its licenses and its development costs and all the rest of it going. That year we made about a million pounds in profit from the, from the kind of computer bit of the business, um, which I thought was pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, and during that year we were starting to add one or two more people to the sales and marketing team, still having to pirate the, uh, the, the engineers as and when we could get them. Um, the next year, actually, we were quite stable. We got a bit of a team going. We got some stuff going. We were doing various different things. You're welcome. That, that's, uh, that's all clan stuff if anybody's interested. And um, we were doing various different things. Now, where did I put those? That's it. Um, a lot of it was just kind of simple marketing stuff like trading deals and st things like that to try and drive sales. We were doing, we were doing quite a lot of uh, marketing of those sorts of things four options, you know, th these sorts of things we were doing quite a lot with the channel, working with the sales and the, the, the dealership, trying to, you know, just keep the whole thing going. Um, we actually ended up in 97 with a team of nine people, including myself. So it started with me and we slowly built it up as, we, as the business sort of settled and stabilised. And actually in 97 we made another a million pound profit as well, selling, selling lots of stuff. But there were a lot of issues that we were starting to have to deal with. Um, the first one of them actually was um, stock. Now stock doesn't sound like the most enthralling thing but Acorn had not had, so this is, this is probably about the most confidential thing I'll share. That was, it's not from 97 because it's the only one I've got, it's from August 98, but that is the listing of our inventory, that what we had in the warehouse. So I'll pass that one around. That was after, <laughs> that was after any of this stuff. Um, so we had, we had a lot of stock and we were constantly, I was in constant meetings trying to work out, was this still saleable? Could we get any money for it? Did we have to write it off? Because obviously every time you wrote stuff off, that went against your profits, it went against everything we were trying to do. I mean, it w wasn't a cash issue, but it was a profitability issue. So we were trying to find ways of shifting things. And if you look at the stock report, uh, 89, you'll see all sorts of like Scion A-links and things like this that are just so old that it's almost impossible to do anything with, but we're still on the books and still had a book value. Uh, and so that was quite a large part of our focus. And I was looking at some of the other numbers and I think we did manage to drive down our stock holdings quite significantly during that time, which of course is very profitable because you get rid of it and it's gone. <laughs> um, and then we had another, we had another set of problems, uh, and this is actually, this was much, much more serious. So the RISC PC was a fantastic product, but there were new regulations coming in about EMC. And frankly, we tried lots, but there was no way we were going to get that plastic chassis design through EMC. We tried spraying it inside with black, with conductive stuff, we tried all sorts of things. Nothing was going to work in terms of actually solving that problem. And the other thing is, it's a manufacturing problem. The sorts of problems we were dealing with as Acorn are the worst sort of volume you can possibly have in a manufacturing environment. So manufacturing environment, you can make tens of something, no worries, they're expensive, but you can do that. You can make hundreds. You can make tens of thousands of something, 
Try and make thousands of anything. It's just awful. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, because you're like, you're, it's like, it's the worst number you can possibly, and that's exactly the sort of volumes we were doing. <laughs> so we had an EMC problem. We had a, we had a, a we had a sort of volume problem. I mean, yeah, we had tooling and stuff already done. So actually that was quite good. But the other thing that was happening is there were new products coming on the market, printers, scanners, and things like that. We never had drivers for them because nobody would write a driver for a RISC OS machine. I mean, why would you bother? There's only a few thousand of them out there. They want Windows machines or Apple machines. Um, so we, um, so, so, um, so we, had, we had all those sorts of things. So we had to try and find a way of doing that. And so we decided we would make a new product, a new version of the RISC PC. And the basic genesis of this was, if we can use more of standard PC bits, it will cut our costs down, because they would, in comparison to what we were paying for a power supply, a PC power supply was like a third of the price, retail, <laughs> let alone in you know, any kind of volume. So anything we could do to use more standardized components was, was going to be helpful. So we thought, well, we're just going to have to use a PC chassis. Horrible though it is, we thought, this is the only way we're ever going to get anything done. Um, so we, so we worked on that. And then we also looked at the, the cards that were coming out. And um, PCI was a relatively new interface in those days. But it was a standardized interface that PCs were using. We thought if we could get PCI cards to work with RISC OS, that would open up a whole range of different peripherals, which we could get access to cheaply, because they're being made in volume for the Wintel market, that we could then use from a RISC OS perspective. So we, we adopted that as well. And, um, um, and uh, so we were, we were starting to develop that. Again, we were beg borrowing and stealing manufacturing resource, engineering resource, software resource. We were also updating RISC OS at that time. Now, the basic way that RISC OS update worked was the engineers working on it did what they felt was the sensible thing to do. I didn't tell them anything, they just got on with it, <laughs> right? Because, you know, frankly, they knew better than anybody. So we, we ended up, we, we were putting in things like uh, 64K colors and that sort of stuff into RISC OS. We were doing a whole load of stuff. They were working really quite hard. Oftentimes in the evenings, because <laughs> they had other jobs to do as well, um, to do that. Um, So that was, that was, we ran Acorn World again, uh, we were just chatting about some of the, I can never remember which one was which, but we did all sorts of mon absolutely nutty things. I mean, I think the fact that we booked out Olympia to run Acorn World was quite, I quite enjoyed the fact that we did that, um, uh, and so on. So during 1997, we were relatively stable, we were selling a reasonable amount, we were starting to develop that. Yeah, that's right, we were starting to develop that. Um, we were putting some effort into that, and... Um, we were selling some stuff through Exemplar. And then uh, early part of 98, uh, we were putting all our budgets together and everything else. They decided to set up the workstations division. David Lee said, well, I want you to separate this from the technology because you've got a fairly stable business here. You know, kind of, let's get that. And so I, I ended up running the workstation division, which was the computer bit, basically. All the rest of it was technology uh, for, uh, for, for, um, for Acorn. And we were still trying to work on the manufacturing problem. So then, then that's when we came up with this design. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to talk tonight, actually, was I wanted to apologize. So this, I want to get this out of the way. So we created this. So these are some of the original photos that we took. So I'm not quite sure why I've still got them. But these are some of the original photos from... <laughs> from the very first time we, we did this. And um, it was the RISC PC2. That's what we'd always refer to it as internally. The project code name was Phoebe. And for some reason that to this day I don't understand, it's probably my worst ever marketing decision, we decided to call it Phoebe, which was just bonkers. Um, and also this hideous yellow color <laughs> was not very nice. We wanted, I wanted it to stand out. We had a bunch of designers in, um, and they said that the trend at that time was for transparent plastic. This was before the iMac, actually. Uh, it was for transparent plastic. But when you actually looked at what the transparent plastic was going on, it was just a metal plate. There wasn't anything interesting behind it. So it would have looked better than this. I've got to say that, probably. But we did want something that was distinctive and different, and it was. 
<laughs> it wasn't great. And the naming thing, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Uh, you'll see, actually, we were reverting back to calling it RISPC2 by the end. Um, but it was just, that was just like the worst bit of everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I screwed up on that. I really did screw up on that. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so, so we carry on. Um, a new guy had joined the company as our finance director, a guy called Stan Boland. And Acorn, globally as a business, wasn't doing very well. The network computers that were the Great White Hope weren't selling. If you look on that stock report, you'll see a thousand of them in stock, <laughs> worth quite a lot of money, even though they're not very expensive. Um, yeah, so, um, so they weren't selling. Online media was still way ahead of its time and wasn't making any money. Exemplar had pretty much stopped selling any Risk OS products and were mostly doing Apple and started to do Windows machines because that's what the schools wanted, them, wanted to buy. Um, and when you talked about network computers with people, it's a brilliant idea, and the first question was, does it run Word? That's all anybody ever asked me about a network computer. Does it run Word? And you go, yes, with a switch. It's like, no, but does it run Word? Well, not on the native, okay, I don't know. And that was it, poof, we just lost it. It, was, it sounded like a brilliant concept. It just didn't fly in the marketplace when we tried it with people. And so the volumes weren't, weren't mounting up. Oracle lost interest, moved on to do other things like databases and stuff that they're quite good at. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and, uh, and because we were investing in the tooling, the design, the development of that, of this thing, um, because we were investing in all of that, we were actually now losing money, which wasn't our mission in the first place. So I found, so by July, I, I got found some numbers on a spreadsheet somewhere, so in a management report somewhere. So in July 98, we were turning over 3.6 million and we'd lost 1.9 million. We were not alone in the divisions of Acorn in doing that, but it was pretty grim. So we weren't doing very well, uh, which was a bit of a shame because we, we had, the previous two years, we'd done extraordinarily well. We'd been, you know, like the one shiny light in the whole of, the whole, whole of everything that Acorn was doing. Um, so yeah, so that wasn't, that wasn't great, but that was mostly because we, were, we spent that year and that six months to, no, to uh, 98, we spent 1.9 million on development. So basically we were investing in a new product because we needed one because the old product was going to become difficult to sell and, uh, and probably illegal. Um, anyway, so Stan had joined a company and at that point, Acorn owned a big chunk of ARM because it had spun ARM out and owned a big chunk of ARM. But because of the way the spin-out had been structured, we were liable for tax on any profits that we made from it. And Stan spent, I don't know how long, talking to advisor after advisor after advisor to try and find a way to realize the ARM shareholding into Acorn without incurring the tax. Because at that point, Acorn's share value was worth, le worth less than the ARM shareholding. So we had a negative value on our business, which is not a good place to be. Um, and so he spent time and time and time and time and time doing this. And then, on um, this, is, this is not the neatest one, but it's the best one I can find. Um, then on the 15th of June, the 15th of June, Stan took over from David Lee. He was sacked, Pete Bonder was sacked, and uh, Graham Dodgson, who was a, you know, Sales marketing guy, was all, they were all sacked. They just all went. He cleaned them out, took over the company. And the, his mission was to liberate the ARM shareholding. That's really what he was aiming. So this is the last days that we were talking about the sort of tail end of Acorn's life. But it wasn't totally, you know, without some sympathy to the, to the existing business. So he, he said to me, what we want you to try and do is uh, come up with a, a management buyout of the computer business. So this is why I'm saying... It is my fault because we actually had a chance to take Risk OS out in a nice clean package, neatly done. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm addressing most of this to you, but I would <laughs> but we did have that chance. Um, but we had to try and build a business case to make that fly because otherwise nobody, you know, we couldn't we couldn't do that. And that proved very hard for me to do. Now maybe I was the wrong guy doing it. I don't know, but it proved very hard for me to do. 
I was trying to protect as much as I could of what we had, of the people and the, the places and things like that. Um, so what we, what we wanted to do was um, we wanted to take RISPC into the, the, the Phoebe and then maybe take that into a development platform for network computers. If we were going to make any headway, it had to be as a network computer business. That was the only thing that made any sense in the long term, really, because a, a proprietary desktop platform competing against Windows and Apple was not, it just wasn't sustainable. But a network computer business, where it was the sort of invisible operating system, could have been a phenomenal business. We struggled with it when we were doing it for the two years before that, but we were trying to do it, I and mean, there was a lot of activity and a lot of uh, work going on on that. Um, so that was um, so that was a version of what we were attempting to do. So you're welcome to have a look at that one. Um, so I, my task, my task was to come up with a business plan for this. So we were, they re actually retained Arthur Anderson to work with me on this. This is the memo that they said. This is what we need to know. These are just the headings of the, bi the different bits of the business plan that you've got to put together, as you would expect for a reasonable sized business plan. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And I worked on it. Um, bear in mind, this is at the point we're launching RISPC2, Phoebe. So we're in the middle of trying to get that whole publicity thing going, but we're trying to also uh, extract that business. And um, this was part of the business plan um, that we came up with. So it's, that's quite, that's a version. It never cleared. This plan was never complete there were a myriad of problems with it. There was too much, too much cost in it, it didn't work, there were too many assumptions, the, the revenue assumptions were not right. It just, and it became obvious by about August that year that this just was not going to fly. Uh, it just, in hindsight, if we'd been utterly brutal and gone, I just want to know, forget all this risk PC nonsense, we're just gonna do that, we'll try and set up a business for that, we might have had a chance with like five engineers and nothing else. No stock, no manufacturing, no, you just get rid of, you know, kind of absolutely pair it right down. But I didn't want to do that. I was trying to keep the business together because that's what I'd always been doing. And that's what we tried to do. And the numbers just never worked out. The assumptions were too difficult. You'll see all sorts of things in there. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's oh right. So that's a bit, that's a bit out of order. Um, that's, that's the organization chart. Sorry, that's a slightly out of order. That's the organization chart after Stan took over. We were still doing things like planning Acorn World. We committed money to that. There was about a quarter of a million quid of exposure for running Acorn World. That obviously, we get some back as people book stands. We were working with our, with our channel partners to do uh, marketing to them. So we were still doing that, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's... So that, that's, that's, the sort of thing we were, that's the sort of thing we were still doing. At the point it got really nasty, um, we, had, we had a lot of exposure to um, the RISC PC2, to Phoebe. We had about a quarter of a million, what, are, what numbers did I have on here? Um, we had, sorry, page two. We had about, about a quarter of a million pounds in parts sitting in Celestica. And we had orders outstanding for about another 300,000 pounds worth of parts for a product that we hadn't yet sold because we were just starting to build it and trying to release it. So in the middle of all of this, we've got massive exposure to stock. We've got exposure to Aiken World, the business running. And trying to square all of that off and create a business was just too complicated for me. And Anderson, Arthur Anderson didn't help me in terms of trying to solve that in... Any, they kept pushing me for, I had to do a five year month by month plan for everything. And people, you know, yeah, okay, so yeah, you understand. You understand yeah, it's, it's hard. And it's hard when everything's changing and there's all sorts of stuff going on. So um, anyway, so it, that didn't look like it was gonna work. And then on the 17th of September that year, we all got told to go over the road, in the, over Newmarket Road, to a church hall opposite, uh, where Stan addressed us and then we each picked up a letter, and that one was mine, that said, that's it, we're done. <laughs> um, which was a bit sad really. And that 
mark the end of it. We came back in, the phones were ringing, it's like, that's it, we're done. Nothing. It's over. Let's just close it. Which is why, actually, RiscOS ended up in a bit of a mess. So, uh, so that's kind of my, my story. Um, Stan obviously did, in the process of shutting us, flogging off online media for next to nothing to pace, and doing a reverse buyout deal with Morgan Stanley eventually, managed to get the ARM shareholding out without any uh, funding. And at that point, he went and set up a company called Element 4T, working with Sophie and John Redford and various others that he took with it. So he did his own thing, taking a technical bit out of the business, and set up Element 14, which was phenomenally successful. And I forget how much that got sold for, but that, you know, he made an awful lot of money out of that. So he, he managed to get his bit out. I unfortunately never managed to get the network computers and the, and the computer bit out of Acorn. Uh, so yeah. So that's that's really that's my my sort of story. I hope that was interesting. Was that I hope that was interesting. I mean, it's not technical. It's much more from a marketing perspective. Happily answer any questions that you have. Uh, yeah, it's quite a lot of technology in this stuff. Actually, there was there was a tremendous amount that we were doing that was really quite exotic, quite unusual. Broadcasting TV signals around networks, Ethernet networks, and offices, all sorts of things we were doing. Um, there's all kinds of technology. I mean, the, the whole business was really miles ahead of it. And it wasn't just, a, so there was a lot of what Acom was doing, but then around it was all these you know, community of developers and other people that were just really making, making a big difference and adding an awful lot of value. Um, so one of, the, one of the last clan things that you saw was about the port of Linux to the Risk OS platform, that, yeah. which was like, so I, I, I met, I met, a, forget his name now, I'm sorry, I do forget his name. But I went and met him in his bedroom, because that that's how he'd done it. It was just one guy at home working on it. Was that Stephen Borrell? No, that wasn't Stephen Borrell. He was working at Acorn. He was working with online media at that point. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, yes. So, yes. He, but there was just one guy on his own doing that. And it was just, that, that was the sort of quality of people we had around us. But. Things mentioned a moment ago about chip light and desk light were two of the products that you were trying to carry on with. Yeah, so that's basically derivatives of the network computer. Smaller ones, um, chip, chip ones are basically network computer in a chip. Um, desk light was a bit more, a bit more sort of infrastructure around it. So if you think about a network computer, it's kind of, okay, we got that. So what's the next logical step? Well, you shrink it down into one chip, so you have a system on a chip. Which is why I say this is quite interesting, because that is essentially what we were aiming for. An internet-connected, network-enabled device that could run whatever you wanted to run, but all of the infrastructure was at the server end, not at the, not at the head end. So, yeah. Do you think you were just kind of five years ahead of your time? Aacom was always five years ahead of its time. Online media was about ten years ahead of its time. You've only got to watch Netflix now to know that's what they were trying to do 25 years ago with HTML technology rather than uh, TCP IP technology. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned EMC problems yeah. with the risk BC. It was EMC that killed the BBC Micro when it yeah. was selling in the States. I'm surprised nobody learned a lesson from that. Yeah. I joined, I joined Acorn after the risk PC had been built. It's, I, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. But clearly, no. It's a plastic box with electronics in, and that's never good from an EMC perspective. You can minimise a bit of it, but you can never get rid of all of it. So that the problems that we always had was that we could not get the latest stuff on our platform. So things like Java, which was freely available, we would have had to pay a monumental licence fee to get it onto Risk OS. I forget exactly what it was, but it, I, forget, I might have been a... Mit hmm? Okay, that, that wouldn't have been such a big deal, but it, I, I thought it was more like a million. But yeah, I mean, it was, it, you know, it, was just, it was just huge. And that caused a real kind of, we needed volume to make that work. You know, if we had volume with the product, then we could do that, no problem. But without volume, you're having to carry a big cost per unit to make something happen that people wouldn't really use. And, and so, but Java was just one thing. It was things like printer drivers and, you know, kind of, display drivers and, and all sorts of things. So just everything was hard. <laughs> and we were trying to minimize that um, and trying to make as much as we could out of that and simplify it. 
to succeed in America is much harder than to succeed in Britain. So you have to be much better, much sharper, much, much more focused. And there were examples of British companies making inroads into America, but it's very, very hard to do well. It's very hard to build up a big market share. So those companies that do succeed are stronger in the way that they handle their marketing, handle their, you know, their legal, handle their production, handle everything. And yes, by the time they've got to satisfying the American market, they're already a lot larger than we were. So, um, because we never managed to make it in the States. Probably could have, but, but it never quite, you know, it's, very, it's a very tough market to work in. Um, I've done other things since, and it's a very tough market to work in. <laughs> it's a huge, you know, it's a huge market and a really, really hard market to, to operate in. So, yeah, so uh, from my own personal point of view, after that, I just stopped. I just went away. I didn't touch Risk OS. I just couldn't. I was just like, no. <laughs> I just walked away from it and ended up working in the mobile, mobile industry. This is technology. We were doing deals. I mean, the, the Oracle deal, if Oracle had been successful, would have utterly transformed the business. If that had flown, if Oracle had really gone for it and were selling in America network computers under their name, with their brand, with their back ends and their everything, that could have utterly transformed Bacon. We could have become like another arm doing that sort of business, doing this type of business, network con internet connected, <coughs> network connected devices that just work, that turn on and start like that, because the, the product was better than pretty much anything else out there at that point. <laughs> but that's not enough, unfortunately. It never is enough, and that's, that's one of the lessons I've learned over time. If you have a better product, you tend to not market it as hard as if you have a worse product. Because if you have a worse product, you know you have to sell it hard because it's worse. So you get very good at selling it. <laughs> uh, but there's a prototype in a Cambridge Museum that works. I mean, we were essentially there. I mean, there was, there was a bunch of stuff we still had to do in terms of getting the ROMs finished and, you know, kind of production run in and yeah. everything else. But the parts were there, the design was there. There was, there was nothing that I can remember at the moment that said we have a massive hole here. There were delays, you know, things slid back by three months from what it should have been, yeah. which never helps when you're, when you're losing money. So we, that's, that's the mode that we were in at that point. So we had to move everything back, you slide that back, then this goes and that changes and all, all, your, all of your five year, month by month projections go completely out the window. <laughs> so yeah. To be honest, I mean, the, the markets we had left were a few schools, this community, and people who were doing something very specific with the Risk OS products, and that was it. That's all we really had for the, for the basic desktop computers. The volume market would have been a thin client sitting under everybody's desk in an office, running to some big back-end server running Citrix WinFrame. That would have been a big volume, because that's, or every classroom in a school, or every kid in a, you know, that, that was the big market. That's where the volume sat. The vo volume didn't sit here. In hindsight, we probably should never have done it. It was a revenue, so the revenue stream was quite good in that we made money selling them, even at that sort of level. Um, the investment wasn't that great because we, you know, we were using, reusing as many components as we possibly could. Um, there, was quite a, there was a bit of tooling and stuff, but not an awful lot because we were basically, re so we weren't having to build a chassis, we weren't having to do all of that, we weren't building power supplies, we, weren't we were buying all of those, as many components in as we possibly could to keep the cost down, and keep the development cost down. And actually redesigning a board, okay, it costs money, but it's not huge. And updating the RISC-OS software was doable by these guys that had been doing it for years and knew what they were doing. Um, and so that was, you know, our ambition was to do what we could and, and actually keep the revenue stream running because without that it would have dried up because we, we would have had to stop selling it, so, <laughs> which would have been a bit awkward. Now, in hindsight, we probably should have been a lot more tough and gone, no, we're not doing that. Just get on with the network computers. That's where it is. Just do it. But we didn't. <laughs> and it wasn't just Acorn suffering from that. Apple suffered from it massively as well at that point. It's worth pointing out. Apple reinvented themselves recently, particularly with the iPhone, but they didn't at that point do anything 
the, their computer business was not doing well for exactly the same reasons as we were struggling. But on a different scale, obviously, but you know, they were having the same sort of problems. That was a There's always delays in product. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if anybody here has worked in manufacturing industry, but in the actually making things, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Making stuff is hard, <laughs> right? It's expensive, it's difficult. There's a myriad of things that go on. We had some brilliant people doing the manufacturing for us uh, at Acorn. Uh, working with Celestica on it. Um, Phil Smith was a guy that ran it, and he was, he was very, very good. But it's just difficult. You know, you get, you get a thing, oh, we need to change that, which means we have to re relay the board, which means we have to go back around it again, which means we have to get pre you know, It's just like, and boing, suddenly you've got another six weeks, eight weeks. Yeah, I, I had had experience when I worked for the test and measurement company making oscilloscopes. We had a factory, and we made them. So I was used to working with manufacturing, so I, I you know, and the lines and the issues and bad solder joints and things that happen in manufacturing. I'm quite used to that, but, uh, but it, was, it doesn't make it any easier <laughs> to, to handle and manage. Yes, you, you, you've got it open source, which is fabulous. I mean, yeah, so I apologise for the shambles. <laughs> That's all I can say is I really apologise for that shambles because it could have been a lot cleaner and a lot neater, but it wasn't. Um, and it, yeah, it was, it was a complicated time for a public limited company, because remember Acorn, I mean, I've got those, I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen them, but those are the public, you know, the, the public um, report and accounts from Acorn PLC uh, for various different years and various different ones, but you, you know, we were a public limited company, so we had to report to the shareholders and stuff. And so, mm -hmm. Yes, and that's always challenging, especially when things aren't going well. Okay, I mean, yeah, but I mean, look at the things that are out there now. Chromebook, that's essentially what a Chromebook is. It's cloud connected, it's, that, that's really what it is. I mean, they, they, these things exist 20 years later in a quite a not dissimilar form, but we just, and, and actually would have been really good because we didn't have moving parts, we had firmware operating systems, we didn't need hard disks. All sorts of things that we had as a technical benefit would have been absolutely brilliant. Never, nobody ever really did that much with acorns. They did it with BBC micros, but not so much with acorns. You did. Okay. <laughs> All right. A few people did that. <laughs> yeah. So where we would have ploughed the money is probably keeping up with browser technology and Java and things like that, because that's a nightmare. Just keeping up with everybody is just hard. The more money you have coming, the more you can do that, the more that becomes your platform. So yeah. RISCOS was primarily, um, that's what ART was formed to make, take advantage of. So Acorn Risk Technologies was, mission was to take over RISCOS and do creative and imaginative and new things with it as the intellectual property and to build that portfolio of intellectual property as they went. So, you know, if they did a deal with somebody that required, you know, kind of a Java port, then that would then become available the, uh, we tried to get it so that those were available across everything that we did. It doesn't always work like that, but that's what they were trying to do. So as they developed new things, they were trying to build that intellectual property base to become an intellectual property licensing business, which is what Acorn Risk Technologies was all about. It was about intellectual property licensing, similar to ARM, moving away from the hardware end of it. Because nobody cared. At the point Stan closed us, he'd given up on this. He only cared about the ARM money. He just didn't care about it is the honest answer. That's, that's the bit, that, that's, that's what I see as the, as the rationale. I mean, it, yeah, he, every, the online media went off, they paste bought it, they got whatever they got. Element 14 took whatever they wanted. Nobody cared, it was just, the rest was just, there was a warehouse full of junk that presumably got scrapped at some point. There was intellectual property lying about all over. Nobody, no, didn't have any significant value at that point to anybody. They probably did, but you know. Not that anybody could tap into. Not, it. That anyone would have not that anybody. Not that anybody could figure out a way of tapping into at that point. Well, it could have been, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it could have been. Yeah, I mean, it, easily. But we didn't have touchscreen technology in those days, really. <laughs> that that Apple touchscreen stuff that came in with the iPod, yeah, it didn't exist. <laughs> so no, not in the way that Apple did it when they finally got that cracked. Uh, they tried to. They, they d way before my time, they had tried to, but no, didn't work. It's not. Because businesses bought from IBM. 
because businesses buy from IBM because nobody ever got fired from buying IBM is the is the slogan but but essentially that's what it was they bought what everybody else was buying that's just the way these things were Everybody, everybody's got Raspberry Pi because everybody knows about that. There's a, there's a whole network of an infrastructure of people, a community around it. And that's the bit, actually, that I was brought in to recognise and try and build up to defend the, the community around so that we didn't, so that you guys didn't get picked off to run on Linux or Apple or Windows or whatever. For my sins, I actually enjoy doing trade shows. Um, I, I still, I mean, I'm, I mean, we were just chatting about it earlier here. Um, so I quite enjoyed Acorn World, no matter how stressful they were. Uh, we did some really nutty things. We did some completely bonkers things at Acorn World because we could, and, uh, and it was kind of interesting. Um, from a marketing point of view, I think the Byte front cover was probably the best thing that we ever did, um, just in terms of outreach and trying to generate a bit more of visibility for the Acorn product outside of our community. But I, in all honesty, one of the nicest things about working for Acorn was when I first started, I walked, I'd been driving an hour each way up and down the M11 every day, and I walked past my kid's school, dropped him off, and then wandered into the office. And I could, I could wander home as well. Um, and the lake and everything was just beautiful. And I think everybody had relaxed at Acorn at that point and just taken their foot off the gas a little because they'd made it. And it was lovely and it was very nice. By the time I joined, Sophie was, yeah, she was predominantly working in online media with Malcolm Bird um, and a guy called John Redford as well, who now works at Broadcom. Um, so, yeah, so they were, they were predominantly in the online media bit. But actually, towards the end, I, I, okay, so another little snapshot of Stan working. I, one evening, this, this is after he'd taken over, so sort of like towards the end, he, we were, he was pitching, he wanted to pitch to some potential investors. And the night before, it's like, what are we talking about? And nobody had a clue what it was we were going to pitch, right? Um, and the, those investors included Herman Hauser as well, you know, from Amadeus as he is now. Um, but uh, and he was sitting with Sophie, and they were bat batting about various different ideas. And it was a complete shambles. And that was the night before. The next day, I watched him pitch a really coherent, very, very powerful <laughs> sales pitch for this technology. And it was brilliant. And I'd have bought it. And I was thinking, how does he do that? <laughs> how on earth did he manage to do that and create this story out of, I mean, what I'd seen the night before was nothing much. <laughs> so, yeah, I, but that was partly Sophie's influence because she actually understood it. She really got it. She could piece the pieces together and understand. And, and she was the, the driving catalyst from the technical point of view for Element 14. So, because um, she went with him to Element 14 and then they did all sorts of exotic and unusual things at Element 14.